Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Future Career Snippets, uh, where students will chat with experts. This event is organized by the SEER, Scientix, the STEM Alliance, and the Career Advisors Network. I'm Aishwarya, the Project and Pedagogical Officer of the SEER project and in charge of coordinating the online chats, and I will be moderating today's chat. We are joining you from European Schoolnet, based in Brussels. Uh, before we begin, I would like to remind all our participating schools to keep their videos and audios off to protect the privacy of the students joining today. Thank you very much. I see that all of you have kept your video and audio off, so thank you very much. So what's the theme of today's chat? Today we will be focusing on STEM careers, and we have two speakers for today. The first one is Elvira Brand, and the second speaker is Crystal Moore. The chat will last 1.5 hours and we will first speak with Elvira for about 40 minutes and then we will be joined by our second speaker of the day, Crystal Moore. So I see that we have several schools who have already joined in and we hope we have more as the session goes on. Uh, I'll explain the proceedings of this chat for those who have joined us for the first time today. So throughout the chat, teachers and students are encouraged to start sending their questions to the speaker by typing in the questions in the chat section. Our experts will do their very best to answer all your questions. And we also encourage you to stay with us the entire session. I trust that my audio is working fine. If you have any issues with hearing me, if you're facing any technical issues, please just send me a message right here and we'll figure it out. This chat is recorded. So you can watch it again later. You can share it with your fellow teachers. You can share it with more students if you like. So let's get to it. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce the first expert for today's chat. Our first speaker is Elvira Brand, a medical editor who works at National MS Foundation in the Netherlands. She will be sharing with us her journey to becoming a medical editor and more about her work. Elvira, welcome to the session today. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, so before we get to the questions from our participants, maybe I can ask you a few questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah? Go ahead. OK, yeah. maybe you can introduce yourself and tell us what you do, what your job is and uh, why you decided to follow this career path. Yes, uh, so. Um, I live in Amsterdam and I am uh, 27 years old and um, <clears throat> I started uh, with my current job uh, two months ago and uh, as Ashwara, or, uh, Ashwara <laughs> sorry, <laughs> already told you I'm a medical editor which means that I uh, write about um, medical topics. And I do this for a foundation that um, that uh, is for uh, multiple sclerosis, and that's a nerve condition. So people who have this uh, disease, uh, their nerve cells are uh, damaged, so uh, that uh, eventually they ca cannot uh, move their muscles. As, as well and sometimes they also end up in wheelchairs and um, my job is uh, to uh, I'm uh, writing for a new website and it's uh, full of information for patients with this disease so uh, it's it's not online yet but next year it will be and um, then if they if the patients go to this website, they can um, yeah, find out all information about the disease, about medication, uh, treatment, but also things like how, yeah, how do I live with it? How do I maintain friendships? And also more of the personal stuff. And um, so I, uh, I just go online, do, do research, and then I write, uh, the articles and um, yeah before this I uh, studied uh, in Amsterdam as well my study is uh, 
psychobiology, uh, which is a study of the brain. And um, uh, that's my bachelor. And then for my master's, I studied neurobiology, which is essentially the same. It's also a study of the brain. That's very interesting. And how do you uh, make this shift to write about uh, MS in particular? Um, <clears throat> I um, I shifted be uh, before I did shift. I was already working in a um, volunteer organization, and. Um, there, I already uh, wrote articles uh, about uh, brain science, and I really liked that. So then I applied for this job. And also, yeah, also just uh, throughout my uh, uh, study uh, period, I also joined some writing. Uh, clubs. So for example, I, I was in a study association and they had a newsletter and I already did some writing for that. So that way I could practice. OK, and your writing, it's always been in English? Uh, Dutch, and English. In Dutch? Dutch and English. Dutch and English? Yes. Yeah. And this website, is it in both Dutch and English? Uh, no, it's only in Dutch. Only in Dutch? Yes. OK, all right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it will be very useful to anyone who goes on such a website because I um, is there already a lot of resources online in your, you know, from what you have seen? Yes, there is a lot, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's confusing because it's really scattered around around the Internet. Ah, so okay. this website really brings all the information together in a more structured way. OK. Yeah. We have a few questions already coming in from okay. the students. Uh, it's nice to know that there are many students joining us. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, it's very exciting. All right, the first one. So what do you enjoy the most about your job and why? This is from Irina. Yeah, um, I enjoy the most that um, every week I can dive into a new topic uh, around uh, MS. So, um, for example, last week I was really reading a lot about uh, medication and um, this week I'm uh, doing something completely else, uh, like really like check, for example, checking the, the, the stuff that my colleague wrote about uh, nerve cells. Um, so I have to, um, yeah, read about something really in depth so I can really sort of, yeah, get myself acquainted with uh, new things every day. And I also really like that it's, uh, it's going to be read by patients. So I really feel like I'm doing it for them also. Uh, which is also a really nice feeling. Thank you. Yeah. Second question from Elena. She says, my students are curious to know what did you like to do when you were a kid? And nice, <laughs> nice to be here with you. Nice. I'm we are glad you're here, Elena. <laughs> cool question. Yes. What did I like to do as a kid? So many things. <laughs> um, I really liked uh, playing with my friends. I played a lot with Barbie. <laughs> and uh, also um, playing outside. So uh, I had a really nice street, uh, which was really quiet and a lot of kids were there. And we always went outside and uh, made up our own games and did that. And I also really liked uh, drawing and doing art as a kid. And I still really like that. Do you get to do any drawing for this job? 
Uh, no, not for this job, but I do get to be creative because, um, yeah, for writing you also need creativity. Um, and especially because the topics are difficult and it's my job to translate it in more simple uh, language for everyone to understand. So sometimes you have to uh, come up with um, interesting metaphors or uh, just, yeah, new ways to explain something. Mm. So that must not always be easy to take complex topics and complex ideas and to make it simple. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's difficult and uh, I, I have the help of colleagues with that so I mm -hmm. can discuss it. And uh, it really helps for, yeah, if I really understand something, it makes it easier to, um, yeah, to explain it. But it's, it can also be a little bit confronting when you don't really understand something, then it's really difficult to explain it in simple, simple language. Okay, okay. And I was wondering, what does your regular work day look like? Yes, yeah, so um, usually I, um, yeah, I always have a to-do list. Uh, so I look at my to-do list and um, yeah, uh, most of the time I have either my own articles to write or I check uh, other people's work and um I try to uh, s switch a bit between um, between those. And uh, when I write my own articles, I first uh, look at all the resource resources online. So I look at all the websites with information and I read all about it. And then I um, I will write about it. And sometimes in the afternoon I have a meeting with my colleagues and we talk about what's, how things are going and uh, what we should add, what we should leave on the website, uh, things like that. And I also um, take a walking break in between. I think it's really important. <laughs> so during lunchtime I go outside. Okay. And what kind of skills are required to do a job like this? You mentioned uh, creativity, but other than that. Yeah, creativity. And also uh, you have to know something about uh, the workings of the disease. So um, knowledge about uh, this medical side, it's important. Um, yeah, other than that, um, also communication skills, because you have to always um, talk to colleagues about um, yeah, how, how to do the job. So that's important. Um, and also it's important to, um, yeah, in Dutch it's called Hoofd and bijzaken, and it's translated as um, important things and less important things, and how to make a, disti a distinction between them. Because there's so much information, and you really have to filter uh, what to include and what to not include. Okay, if we can go back to your school days a little bit. Uh... What kind of subjects did you enjoy the most? Within science, uh, did you have some favorites? Yes, um, I like biology the most. Okay. And um, that's because I, in biology, essentially you study your own body. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's it. it's really cool to, yeah, understand more and more about how the body is working and, as a kid, I was already so fascinated by um, yeah, the world around me and also like everything is so well designed or like because of ev evolution, it's, it's like this. But yeah, it's incredible. All the systems that seem to perfectly work together 
and yeah, make a body function like this. Yeah, and once you finished your bachelor's and your master's, were there any other career options that you were considering before entering, you know, writing? Yes, yes, I had a year after my uh, master's where I did a traineeship and it's um, a combination of uh, school and working. So uh, from Monday to Thursday, I was working and on Friday I had uh, yeah, class or um, yeah, learning days. And um, this was in the business field. So something completely different. Um, and I did it because I wanted to see if it was for me. <laughs> but after one year, I decided, no, I I miss science. I miss studying the brain and I want to continue to do that. But still, I, I'm happy I did it because now I know for sure that that is not what I wanted to do. Yeah, it, it's nice to um, experiment a little, isn't it? To see what you like yeah, at an early yeah. stage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, um, uh, just a second, seeing if we have any other questions. All right. So medical editing as a profession and medical writing, is, do you think it's a, a field that's growing right now? Um, yes. Well, I I'm not sure if it's really growing, but I'm sure that there's more awareness that this is important because um, there is, of course, so many scientists on the one hand, and also you have the society as a whole. And um, yeah, it's, it's important that there's um, that the knowledge that the scientists know uh, also reaches the public because otherwise they are always on their little island and there's um, so many interesting things that they find but um, it's also good that it's the knowledge is spread around and also the other way around that um, for example if there are um, questions or issues from from society that the scientists also know you know what's going on so i think that bridge is really important and i think um in the netherlands this is people are becoming more and more aware of this because there's so much um misinformation uh so and um, because science can be really complex, and I noticed that sometimes it's it's hard to understand for most people. Uh, so it needs to be uh, communicated in the right way. And in the Netherlands, they are also setting up um, a whole organization right now from the government to do this. So I definitely think there's it's growing, yes. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, maybe it's something that the students who are joining us now can think about. Yeah. yeah so it's a possible option for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And to that be, would also, yeah. Yeah, to be in, in with one leg in, in science community and one leg in society. Uh, I, I like how you're putting that. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> <laughs> And when you joined um, this organization or when you started your career as a medical writer and an editor, what surprised you the most? What was it that was a little unexpected for you? Hmm. Well, I feel like I haven't really started my career yet because um, I'm still on the beginning uh, because I'm also doing a course in journalism and uh, eventually I I want to be a science journalist. Um. Ah, okay, we, we have more to 
Get yeah, it. Okay. there's more to yeah. uncover. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just started this course. Okay. And <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, what uh, what surprised me? I don't know. I think I I will I will be surprised in the future. <laughs> okay, I I think this combination of science and journalism it's fascinating. Yeah, right. There's so much to be done. Like what you said about about misinformation. As a journalist, you can do a lot to make sure that the right news is passed on to the people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In in that case, what are you most excited about journalism? This. Um, what do you hope to um, accomplish with this uh, degree? Because you're already writing. You're already. You have some experience. Yes. Yes. Um, I want to uh, write about new um, research that is done. Mm -hmm. So um, research is going so fast, like every year there are so many new discoveries, uh, especially in, in brain science, but also in other uh, topics. And I want to write about that. So, okay. for example, by interviewing uh, scientists. Okay. I think we will get a lot of um, good articles that way. <laughs> I hope, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And also, when I was younger, my parents had the newspaper, and um, there's always this, a little science section, and I always went to that section first. And okay. I think that's where I got my inspiration. Yeah, yeah. I wonder how many of our students who are joining today, um, how familiar they are with newspapers, because it's uh, not as popular as it once was. A lot of the news is online. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a changing world. Yeah. Think, yeah. Makes but sense. But even, even online, I think, I don't know if everyone uses social media, but there's also so much, uh, yeah, news that is covered uh, and put online. Yeah different ways of uh, delivering yeah mm. yeah all right and uh, how do you balance your uh, work life and your personal life uh yeah that's a good question um by not working full time i think mm -hmm. um i work part time and part time i do this uh, study this course of journalism and uh but of course it's it's not easy for everyone but um to work part-time but if it's possible then it's really an option i think and um also i see a lot of people uh working overtime um but i think uh in a lot of jobs you have to set boundaries if possible. Um, and yeah, that's what I also try to do. Just tell my boss, this is what I can do and nothing more. Mm. Uh, but my boss is really nice and chill. And that's what I also really like about this job that the work environment is just, it feels good because in my business, uh, work which i did uh before this um everyone was pushing me so hard and uh -huh. it was really not nice and i had to set boundaries all the time but that was also a sign for me that okay maybe this work environment is not good for me and now i'm in a job where i can set my own pace and that's really a good sign for me that this is a good work environment for me. And um, yeah, I just try to do uh, fun things after work and in the weekends and, you know, uh, just meet with my friends or go to the cinema. Just, yeah, make time for my hobbies. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was also, uh, you, you mentioned volunteering, that you did some volunteering when you were uh, pursuing your master's. 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I was well, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how volunteering can help in figuring out what you want to do. Like, what what has been your experience? Yeah. Uh, so I did um, uh, two things uh, during my master's uh, and my bachelor. I was uh, in a student society, and um, yeah, you can also call it volunteering. That I was in the in the writing newspaper writing club, and. Um, Sorry, what was the question again? I forgot. <laughs> no, I, maybe you can just tell us more about how it can help. Like if if, um, if you could help the students understand how oh, volunteering yeah, yes. can help them. Yeah, I think it's a really uh, low key way to um, try new stuff because mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can also try it by uh, doing a job, but then you know you're tied to the job. Um, with volunteering, you also have responsibilities, but it's, um, yeah, it's really uh, less effort, I think, to try new things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Considering that your um, choices and how you have moved from uh, studying science and you're going into journalism now, it's a rather unconventional way of pursuing science. You're keeping your interest in science, but you're also being creative and writing. Now, yeah. if a parent or a teacher wanted to encourage their students to, you know, think out of the you know, out of the box and do something different, you know, there are many options. The scope is you know, the world is your oyster. So, um, how can they encourage their kids to think out of the box? Um. Hmm. Let's see. Um, I think just by, you know, joining these kinds of things that they are doing now and uh, showing stories of um, all kinds of uh, career paths. Um, yeah, and in my studies, um, it was really encouraged to um, do this one track of staying in the academic uh, career uh, lane. So for example, doing a PhD after master's and then a postdoc. But um, yeah, a lot of my uh, peers also uh, started to do uh, medicine, for example, or uh, went also into business. And um, yeah, it's, it's also good to look around you, like what are my, uh, the people of my age doing? And also people that are a little bit older than you. Yeah. It's a good way to learn. Yeah, by yeah. looking at brothers or sisters or, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know where to meet those people, but for me, it was also encouraged to um, to uh, I think find people who, when I was in my bachelor's, find people who are who were in their masters already, and then just ask them, "Hey, do you want a coffee? And can we talk about how you are doing your career?" And um, that was really helpful for me to get some opinions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, what do you think are other related jobs in this field? Mm. Oh. A lot of people I know, no, not a lot, but some people I know uh, work in uh, government organizations. So, for example, the municipality. And um, that's, I think that's also somewhere where you can sort of combine a lot of uh, skills and 
Yeah, be also like a spider in the web. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So from what I understand and what you've told me, there's a whole world of options here. There's, yes. There's <laughs> one way to do things. Yeah. And personally, I didn't even know I was going to do this until last year. Ah, okay. So it's perfectly fine to really not know what you're doing, where you're mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that, um, yeah, it's there's so many roads to take to get to this point. So, for example, I did first, I focused a lot of years on neuroscience because I just found it interesting, even though I didn't know yet what to do with it. but. I thought, okay, it's education. I it's it will be useful at some point, and then um, I had to take a year or something to decide. Okay, but what what do I want to do now? And um, because the most obvious way was to do research to become a researcher, but for me that was not what I wanted because um, you have to focus for a couple of years on uh, one topic, but I, I want to focus on a lot of different topics. And, um, and I thought, okay, what else do I like besides uh, studying the brain? And that is to be creative and to um, work with, uh, yeah, work with text and writing. And yeah, that's how I came up with this. But it was really a process of also talking a lot with my friends, talking a lot with my colleagues and with my parents. And yeah, just sort of the more I talked about it, the more the idea crystallized and became what I'm doing now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that's your story. I'm sure the, the students have um, learned something new today. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> All right. So we um, now have the second speaker for the day. As we hang around, you will, I'll talk to you later in the session. Thank you. Yes, thank you for, thank you. Uh, <laughs> for the You're hosting. Welcome. <laughs> All right, so now the next speaker for the day, we have Crystal Moore, who joins us from the University of Barcelona. She's a pre-doctoral researcher. Hi, Crystal. Hi, how are you? Thank you for I'm having fine. me. I'm fine, how are you? Yeah, I'm well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, again, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problems. Pleasure to be here. So would you like to quickly introduce yourself and your job? and maybe why you decided to follow this career path and what yeah, you do. Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. So right now, yes, I'm working as a pre-doctoral researcher at the University of Barcelona. So that basically means that I'm getting my doctorate. So that's a four-year degree and I'm doing that in the field of environmental sciences and ecology. Um, but Basically what that means is I'm actually sitting in the in-between between social sciences and environmental science, which is a very unusual area. So how did I get here? Why is this the area that I'm working in? Um, I guess I, I grew up in Australia. I was always very passionate about the natural environment. I was always very curious about the natural environment. Um, but I think all of the adults around me when I was a child recognised that I also had a gift for writing. So I was always pushed into writing, but I knew I wanted to be in the environmental space. So when I was in university, I, for my undergraduate degree, I enrolled in my, my first degree, which was communications. So that was more social science, um, journalism kind of focused. Uh, and then during that, I did a lot of different volunteering activities, a lot of different internships. I went on a volunteer trip to South Africa where we were basically doing some science journalism stuff there. And 
at that time, I really realized I do want to be a writer, but I definitely want to be in the environmental space. So once I graduated, I started working in science communication. So I was a writer. I worked for science publications, um, magazines. I was writing. I was helping researchers um, in research organizations. But I found that I was mostly getting jobs in medical sciences. So I was working in biomedical research. Um, I was working with some really brilliant minds. Um, but that wasn't really where I wanted to be. I wanted to be in the environmental space. So I spoke to um, mentors. I spoke to a lot of people already in the environmental space. And I tried to figure out how I could rework my myself into environmental science. And basically, everyone suggested you need to go back to university. You need to do a master's in this area because your expertise is in writing. You need expertise in the area that you would like to, to be in. So I went back to university, got my master's in environmental science, um, and I loved it. I loved it so much that I decided this is where I want to be. <laughs> of course, my passion for environmental science came through. I realized, yeah, this is absolutely where I'm meant to be. So once my master's finished, I decided to continue on with my PhD. So this is basically the degree that's a level above your master's. And it, it just really stuck with me. So I applied for a few different, well, I applied for two different PhDs um, outside of Australia because I wanted to, to be honest, I wanted to be in Europe because the funding for environmental science and climate change is a lot better here in Europe than in my home country. So I applied for some universities in Europe and I was very lucky um, I got offered a position with the University of Barcelona. So now I'm working with them on the Life Terror project, which is um, an EU-wide project which aims to plant half a billion trees all throughout Europe. So it's a tree planting initiative, but we also look at social science and education and transferring knowledge to, to societies. So that's why I'm in this in-between space where I'm in environmental science and I love environmental science. But I'm also looking at the human element of it and looking at how can we get people motivated to take you know, action against climate change? How can we communicate climate change better through other researchers? Um, these are just some of the topics that I'm working on because I think that science is incredibly important, but I think we don't communicate it very well to people, which I think doesn't encourage people to take action. So that's basically where I'm at. I want to help people understand and I want to help um, scientists communicate. All right. Yeah, um, it's like an interesting coincidence that both the speakers we have today are very interested in communications. That both of you, although it's a bit different in how what you exactly communicate, but both of you are writers. It's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting for me. <laughs> we have our first question, actually. So Irina asks, when you were young, did you ever think you were going to choose this career path? If not, what could you tell us you thought you were going to work or study? Oh, that's a good question. I think, honestly, I thought that I was going to be a writer. I thought I was going to be a journalist. Um, but yeah, like I said before, I really wanted to be in the environmental space. So I was always torn between these two things of I love the environment, I love ecology, but I also really like writing. And you do get to write a lot as a researcher, but as, as a kid, I honestly never pictured myself as a researcher. I think once I got a little bit older and I started going to university and I started seeing more, honestly, female researchers, I think I realized that it was something that I was capable of doing. Um, but as a kid, I didn't really feel that that was where I could be. <laughs> and you were telling us about your, you know, how you got back into environmental science to, um, so that you could pursue your passion for writing and stay in that. And earlier your options were between biomedical and environment and you chose environment. 
Yes, I think yeah. I was always more interested in, in environmental. It was just mm -hmm. that um, because I had experience writing for biomedical publications, mm -hmm. that was where I kept on getting jobs. So I really enjoyed it. I really enjoy science generally. Um, mm -hmm. I was also working in for a physics publication at one point, the um, Australian Institute of, of Phys Physics. But okay. yeah, it was always environmental science that I wanted to be. All right. And currently you're pursuing your uh, doctorate. Mm -hmm. And um, may I ask which year are you in right now? How many years in are you? Yeah, of course, I'm halfway through. So I'm at two years of four years. Okay, two out of four. Mm -hmm. And what does your uh, work day look like currently? Do you also mm. teach? I do teach. Okay. So a lot of my work is in front of the computer. Um, so when I collect my data, so when some researchers collect data, particularly in, in environmental science, a lot of them go out to the field and they're taking soil samples or, you know, water samples. But because my work is with humans, when I'm collecting my data, I'm usually doing it through surveys. So um, I did build a carbon footprint calculator at one point. So if I want data through that, I'll go and give, I'll go and teach, I'll do a workshop about our carbon footprint, then we'll get everyone to fill out the, the calculator, do a survey afterwards. Um, but primarily, I there is a lot of writing involved. So writing has <laughs> been very crucial to my role. Um, but additionally, yes, there's a lot of workshops, a lot of teaching. I sometimes work as a teaching assistant for a master's program of sustainability. So it is very varied. There's a lot of different things that I do day to day. Okay. And what do you enjoy the most among all the different things that you do? Maybe Ooh. other than writing. So you are passionate about writing. So what else do you yes. enjoy? To be honest, I really enjoy analyzing data. I think mm -hmm. it's really nice seeing, because when you first look at data, it just looks like a bunch of numbers. It doesn't really make sense. Or if you've done a survey, it just looks like a bunch of words. It doesn't really look like it all works together. And then as you're analyzing it, something happens in your brain where suddenly everything starts to work together and you start to see a pattern and then you start to realize what the story is behind this data. Um, and maybe that's again where my writing background comes in. But you do, you start to see a story and you start to see what this data means and what it could mean for research more broadly. Okay. <laughs> While you're on that, then what do you find the most challenging? Hmm. Honestly, I do think the writing part is quite challenging because this is writing in a different way. Before I was writing almost creatively, but now I'm writing in a very structured way for research publications. So that's quite difficult sometimes. Um, and also sometimes because my data comes from people, uh, it is difficult to collect good data. <laughs> mm. um, so maybe sometimes we have some incomplete data. That can be a challenge. Um, but yeah, primarily the writing part because it's very, very structured. Okay. And what kind of skills do you think are required to um, get to where you are to pursue a pre-doctoral? Honestly, I think to do almost any degree, I think you just need dedication. I think you need to be willing to make sacrifices, um, dedicate yourself to something. And I really think it's possible if you just put the time in. Um, I remember when I first started doing my master's and all of my friends were saying, you must be so smart, you're doing a master's. And I would always say, kind of, but honestly, I think anyone can do it. If you read enough, if you dedicate yourself enough, I think that it's achievable. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So other than dedication, um, mm. in science especially, it can be a bit complex for some, it can be, <clears throat> excuse me, a little, especially for uh, young girls, a lot of, like you were talking about female engagement some time back and how a lot of girls are not encouraged to take this up. How do you think we can um, do it? How, how do you think we can get more girls into this field? Mm, I think 
I think visibility is a big thing. So I think Mm -hmm. that if you are able to reach out to a mentor, if there's a particular area that you're interested in, maybe you can find a scientist who's willing to talk to you about their job and what they do. Maybe you can meet with them every now and again. But often there are also programs that you can look at. Um, For example, I know that there's one called Code Like a Girl and it's about coding and it's about female empowerment and so there are quite a few different things that you can enroll in that are focused at women in science. Mm, Okay and how do you think uh, teachers and parents can help their daughters do it? I think Mm. maybe young girls can enroll themselves in different programs but is there anything teachers can do in particular? Mm, It's a good question. I think like I said before, I think visibility is a big thing. I think right. if you're, if you know researchers, um, if you're able to reach out to your local university and maybe ask some of the researchers to to come and do talks yeah. about their research, um, and yeah, look at local events. Sometimes there are some events at libraries or um, at science centres. Um, I don't actually know any of the science centres here in Barcelona, but I know in, in Australia we have a few like science museums. And Mm -hmm. often researchers come and do chats at them. Um, So, yeah, I would say that's probably the best way. I think just showing people, having visibility of women researchers, I really think that makes such a huge difference. There was actually, um, there was a study a few years ago. They asked, I think maybe 10 years ago, they asked um, a bunch of school children to draw what they thought a researcher looked like. And the overwhelming majority drew a man in a lab coat, like, you know, Mm. Albert Einstein, crazy hair. Yeah. And then very recently they redid that study and this generation, almost all of them drew their gender. So the women drew women researchers, the men drew men, male researchers. So it is getting better. And I really think visibility is a big part of that. Okay. I think that's a very good answer. Seeking out uh, role models. Yes. In your neighborhood and in your city. Yeah. Mm, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I was also curious about, um, so you made the shift from um, creative writing to uh, more structured writing, and now you're doing your PhD. What has surprised you the most in the last few years? Um, I think, to be honest, when I was in high school and we were asked to pick our subjects for our final years of high school, I, I imagine it works quite similar here in Europe, but in Australia, your last two years of high school, you're asked to select your subjects and those subjects directly have an impact on what you can, what degrees you can, you can take at a university level. So when we were asked to do that, I remember I had this impression that what subjects I choose will basically write my future. <laughs> mm. If I enroll in, in, you know, physics classes, I will be able to go into a physics degree. If I enroll in environmental science, I will be able to go into environmental science. And thinking that that was, that was it. I, I couldn't change after that. And the thing that surprised me is that that's absolutely not the case. There is always a side door. And there is always a way to achieve what you want to achieve. There is always a way to get into the degree that you want to get into, to change into a different degree. There are so many avenues. um, And I wish I had have known that at the time because maybe I would have not put so much pressure on myself. Mm. So I think, I guess what surprised me is that there's always a way to change. There's always, you can always change your mind. You can always shift. Um, so don't be afraid to explore new new passions, new avenues, because they're available. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do we have any more questions here? We have several participants, so please feel free to ask your questions to our experts today. Both of them will be around for a while. Please send in your questions. If students are listening, hi to all of them. Okay, so let me ask you more questions while the teachers and the students think of more. 
So if not a uh, uh, doctorate, so you, you pursued your master's. Was your master's also in Australia? Yes, my master's was in Australia. Um, it was with a pretty good university there. <clears throat> To be honest, like I said before, one of the only reasons that I didn't continue with my PhD in Australia is because the field that I'm in, it's much better funded in Europe. Yeah. Um, the European Union does invest a lot in climate change initiatives mm -hmm. um, and, in environment, and, and in environmental science initiatives, whereas at the time in Australia, that wasn't the case. So, has it? Do you think it has uh, improved in Australia right now? To be honest, not really. It's Australia is a complicated case because we have a lot of coal mines. Um, we're one of the only developed countries that is still opening new coal mines. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of our economy is reliant on that at the moment. So people are very scared to move away from fossil fuel energy and move into clean renewable energy sources. Um, so because of that, there's a lot of climate denialism. Um, so has it gotten better? Not, not remarkably in the last two years. I think mm -hmm. it will. I think it has to, um, because Australia is very, yeah. And Australia is very vulnerable to climate change. So I think it's it also has very to. biodiverse, isn't it? Very. Yeah. It's super biodiverse. Um, and I think that. We we really see the impacts of climate change in Australia. Obviously, we had the bushfires in 2019, I think that was, um, and we're about to have a huge bushfire season again in Australia. So I think it's undeniable that we're witnessing climate change in action in Australia. Okay, okay. Well, that's sad to hear that. So it comes with the summer then? Yes, right, yeah. Right. But I think it has to get better. I think it will over mm. time. It's just that people yes. are slow to adjust because yes. um, people fear change. Yeah. I think it's slow everywhere. It's, uh, it seems to be very slow. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And in your um, move from Australia to Europe, um, what has changed the most for you? Hmm. Is the education I've... system a bit different? Um, it is a little bit, yeah. I think, I guess that the PhD is a funny one because it's it's kind of study, but it's also kind of a job. So here in Europe, in particular, I'm I'm treated like a, an employee. Mm. Um, so definitely, the working culture is different. I think that you know, I'm in I'm in Spain, and Spain is a lot more, um, hmm, maybe a lot more free, I would say, or a lot less structured. Um, a lot of drop-in meetings, for example, a lot of spontaneous stuff, um, whereas Australia is quite rigid, quite structured. So mm -hmm. that's definitely different. Um, the universities are a little bit different. Uh, it, it, the work is a lot more independent, I would say. Okay. But that's okay. not necessarily a bad thing because PhDs are very independent. Yes, yeah. And at the end of your PhD, once you get your doctorate, uh, what are your dreams? That's a good question as well. I thought, to be honest, I change a lot. Um, some days I think that I really want to stay in research because I really enjoy research. Other days I think that maybe I'll go back to my dream of being a science writer, but in an editorial capacity. So I would love to mm. work for a scientific journal. Um, as an editor, I think that would be a dream, especially if it was in the environmental space. Okay, Elvira here. Yeah, she is a, a medical editor, but oh, in, okay, but she writes about MS. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Such a strange <laughs> coincidence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't see it often that people combine those two, but it's possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think we need more. Uh, people writing about science. Yes, particularly in digestible ways, I think, you know, with the science communication gap, um, that was really what drew me to this area of research in the first place. The gap between the, the scientists and the not scientists, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of great research is being done, but it's not being communicated effectively to, to people. And I think that if we could fix that, people would be a lot more engaged and a lot more 
passionate about about science, about things like climate change and medical research as well. Yes, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> And Crystal, um, can you tell us a little bit more about your work with the Life Terra Foundation? Yeah, definitely. So basically, with the Life Terra Foundation, I'm so that's my main project. So all of the work that I'm doing for the university is filtered through Life Terra. So mm -hmm. everything is through them. So, like I said before, it is about tree planting, but it's also about humans and human engagement because. The tree planting is one way to mitigate carbon emissions or yeah, sequester carbon from the atmosphere, but we also can't just take carbon from the atmosphere. We also need to make sure that we're engaging citizens, we're allowing them to understand why we're doing this, why it's important. So there is also an education element. Um, we have a whole platform which is aimed at primary school and high school students um, and that's for teachers to use these materials in their classroom and we also do tree planting events with schools so I'm more focused on that the education side of things I'm also focused on the social part of it so I'm not too involved in the technical stuff I'm more involved in the social impact so I want to basically reach out to people educate them and then see whether or not educating them changes their behaviours. I also want to help researchers communicate more effectively amongst themselves um, to make sure that we're spending resources in the right areas and we're not all focusing, you know, at different universities but all doing the same thing. I think we can all work together a lot better mm -hmm. um, because climate change is a global problem and it affects every single one of us and I think that we need to come together and address it as as a unit not just as individuals doing individual things yeah yeah and you said you were working in the education part of it as well so uh, do you develop um, materials for teachers mm -hmm. yes I was involved in um, developing the the materials for teachers definitely um, mm -hmm. but at this stage what I'm doing with teachers is I'm basically encouraging them to use the the materials Mm -hmm. And then I'm trying to conduct surveys before using the materials and after using the materials to see whether okay. or not there's a change in understandings of the climate emergency or how they want to teach that in their classrooms. Um, so I'm looking at the impact of these materials, basically. OK. Uh, can you think of some more um, career paths for students who are interested in uh, climate change? Because in mm. your experience in Australia and here over the last several years, you might have met a lot of people working in climate change. Yes, definitely. So what are the different avenues? There are so many. And to be honest, by the time that you're all graduating university, I'm sure there'll be more. <laughs> <laughs> this field is not going away. It is, it's growing. So I think you can go into industry, which is... Um, for example, working in non-government organisations that are wanting to address this. So I know that there are some, like in local communities, maybe there are non-government organisations focused on water. Mm -hmm. um, th there are so many different areas. There's energy. You could work in industry for a renewable energy company, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you could continue in academia, so as a researcher. You could become a teacher and you could also work in government. So if you're working in government, I guess you're at the the policy level. So you're making, well, you can help to shape laws um, around climate change. So there are so many different avenues, business, community, um, research and yeah, education. But it's really not going away and there are lots and lots of different different ways to get okay. involved. Yeah, I'm sure, yes. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any more questions? Do your teachers who are here? All right. Uh, would either of you, Crystal and Elvira, would either of you like to share anything else? 
Mm. I feel like I've spoken a lot, <laughs> but yeah, I guess um, to be honest, the last thing that I would want to end on is just what I said before about um, don't put too much pressure on yourself to get it 100% right right now. Um, you can always change your mind. You can always go into different fields. You can always combine your two passions later in life like I did. So, um, yeah, just pursue what what you're passionate about, what you enjoy, and the rest will fall into place. <laughs> That's a wonderful note to end it on. And Elvira, what about you? Yes, I, I actually wanted to say exactly the same thing as Crystal because um, for me, I didn't know what to uh, that I was going to end up where I am now. And uh, yeah, each uh, year, each decision I made was just what I found most interesting uh, and I was most curious about at that moment. So I wasn't really thinking five years ahead. Um, and it turned out well. So yeah, exactly what you said. Just do whatever you like and whatever you're passionate about. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We have one more teacher that has just joined in. So in case, um, Lisa, if you have a question that you want to ask our experts, please go ahead. Uh, if not, we can close the session. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Crystal and Elvira, for joining today. And thank you to the teachers and the students who have joined us today. I think it was a very interesting um, and a very educational session today. And like we've been discussing, it's very exciting to have two writers who are very passionate about communications, but in different ways. And I feel like we've all learned a lot. And um, yeah, we went into different aspects, including the career aspects, what they've studied, and uh, how they have shifted from one to another. And it doesn't have to be a strict path. You can be flexible and find what you love, do what you're passionate about. And thank you to uh, the teachers and the students for the questions. I think they were very important and very interesting. And yeah, we will be publishing a recording of this chat online. We'll also uh, maybe write an article so everyone can read this and you can share this video with uh, other teachers, other students in your other classes. And I hope everyone is a bit more inspired after watching this. So thank you very much. We wish you a very nice rest of the day. And we are going to close the chat now. Thank Thanks you so much for having us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes.